Good evening. Ooh. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody here this evening to this platform event, which tonight is a talk by Simon Ling. Simon Ling's exhibition is currently on in the Kunsthal. Um, it's called The Showing of It, and it's actually the second part of a two-part exhibition project. The first part, The Knowing of It, was a group show, which included over 30 international artists, and which opened in January. And it was followed by Simon's show, and there's going to be a joint publication coming out later in the year. But although it's the kind of second part of this project, and a lot of the thinking that informed the group show has also informed some of the ways that we've been thinking about Simon's work in the production of the show and, and the preparation of the show, it's also very much a standalone exhibition. And, uh, and we're very um, pleased and proud that it's probably the, um, the most major exhibition of Simon's work, um, certainly in Europe. So um, we're delighted to be presenting that here at Bergenkunsthalm in Norway. Um, I'm not going to say too much in an introduction, but uh, I will say that Simon is a British artist who studied at Chelsea and the Slade. He's been exhibiting now for nearly 15 years with solo shows um, in London, amongst other places, and, uh, and a number of group exhibitions, which include the Universal Addressability of Dumb Things, which was curated by Mark Leckie, and Hedvig, which was at the Camden Arts Centre a few years ago, and most recently, I guess, an exhibition at Tate Britain called Painting Now, which featured Simon's work in the context of five um, artists, painters based in, um, in Britain. So I'm going to hand over to Simon, and uh, it just remains for me to, again, thank you all for coming and ask you to join me in welcoming Simon. Thank you. Thank you for coming here this evening. Um, what I'd like you to do is imagine that you're in a black space and it's totally black in front of you. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> For the first 200 million years that life existed on Earth, there were no eyes. Early animals ate algae. They pulsed. They slumped around, but there were no eyes. For the Egyptians, light was God's sight, and things existed because Ra saw them. In the 538 million years of evolution, eyesight has evolved from simple light detecting cells through numerous variations to come to serve as the dominant sense of the planet's dominant species. The eye exists in order to sense light. Light in the absence of eyes illuminates nothing. Visible forms are not inherent in the world, but are granted by the act of seeing. In 1672, Isaac Newton published his theory of color, in which he argued that light is composed of minute particles which obey the mathematically predictable laws of physics. Around the same time, Robert Hooke proposed a wave energy theory of light and color. Wave particle duality is a fundamental property of the universe. This is the most recent, well, I think the only image but it's a very recent image of light acting as wave and as a particle. Mechanistic analogies are not applicable to the nature of the eye. Vision is not merely a passive registering of light values. The eye is no more a camera than a human is a machine. In 5th century Greece, Empedocles believed that Aphrodite made the eye from fire, air, 
earth and water. And she lit a fire in the eye which shone out from it, making sight possible. The mind is in effect projecting a beam, illuminating the world as it searches for meaningfulness. We are not merely sensing light and its interaction with matter. Our minds and eyes are in a creative relationship with the world. Reality is happening in the brain all the time, and it is an act of deep imagination. At this point in the talk, I'm going to show you pictures from, uh, well, of paintings that I've made over the years. And the way that this usually works best is if I put a painting up and then I can tell you a little bit about it. But I'd like to get questions from the audience because that way it becomes a bit more active as a room. And you get to join in, you get to ask whatever you're interested in, and it also indicates, you know, you, you, you can get to ask anything that crosses your mind. There's no stupid questions to ask at this point. So this is a painting from 2006. And it was painted in my studio from a setup where I tried to recreate an eye. Uh, so there was a very lo-fi attempt to make a, an eyeball out of mm -hmm. resin and paper and papier-mâché and electrical wiring, which is what you see as a kind of blood vessel type part in it around the edge. And that was set up that I could look through this big model of an eye at what you could call a still life, which at that time in my studio I had a large assemblage of objects which was a combination of junk that I picked up and things that I had been using or things that had been relevant in my life in some way and things that were totally meaningless or just something that I'd bought the day before. Maybe just groceries or something. So in the middle of this painting there's a there's an orange, and it's sitting inside the inside of an old television. I will point out at this point that until I get a question, I'm not going to move on to the next slide as well. <laughs> so, so you better start freeing yourselves up. <laughs> Yeah, um, you said at this point uh, there are no stupid questions, but at what point will there be stupid questions? I'm hoping there'll be lots of... There are no stupid questions, that's what I mean. <laughs> um, I, I don't know, try and ask a stupid question. Let's see what happens. <laughs> I, I just, just tried, but... Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, that you was a question. Norway. Sorry? You are in Norway, you know, we have come so. Okay. <laughs> okay. This painting is uh, from the early 2000s, and it's painted from the pile of stuff which I had in one half of my studio was taken up with this uh, soup of things. This is painted in a way that uh, I would paint one each day as I came to work I would paint 
the first, well, not the first thing that my eye landed on, but just a, a random piece of this arrangement. And um, so it's a compression of many different times and periods of attention paid to these things. Which is what that leads to the disruption of the of the objects, but um, the result is a, a type of perspective not to do with recession uh, into infinity, but a kind of infinity of time where all the moments are present at the same instant. Any questions? Um, <clears throat> when I was a kid, we used to play this game asking each other, what would you rather be, deaf, mute, or blind? What would your answer be? <laughs> <laughs> what would I rather be? I'd rather be none of those things. Um, Mute. This is another painting from from that period. Is this the same as the last one that it's been painted or? The objects have been added uh, over a certain amount of time, or is it is is this something that has looked like that in reality? Well, the painting looks like that, but there's no yes. way anything could look like that to a human. Uh, it, it I I just compare it to the first one, which I understood was something that no, not that one, the first one that was something that was actually in your studio at mm. a certain time. Yeah. Which the other one, the second one also was, but, but um, it was elements added during a certain time. Well, not, but not, it wasn't, it's not instant is what I'm saying, the second one. Like the uh. photograph. This isn't like a photograph either. Because no, I, I, I know it's not yeah. like a photograph, but uh, a photograph of that object wouldn't be so far as the second one or the third was. Isn't that true? Um, well, in this one, you can kind of see the, 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 the thing the orange is resting in. Uh, mm. Something odd has happened to it, where it's kind of that there's been a double exposure of the thing. If you know, if you imagine that in the, using the analogy of a photograph, so you've got parts of the thing um, appear twice, and that's linked to this activity of, I think, with these. You see, in this one, in the lower portion, you can see a more extensive kind of view of all these objects. But then all around them, that's uh, counteracted. So there's different scales and different um, moments all uh, joined together. If you imagine a big pile of stuff, and then when I would come in to work, quite often I would just shovel it around. So there's this strange tectonic movement of all the things happening. And then I would paint something and then come back the next day and shovel it around again. So it, it's a way of avoiding a lot of questions that I was having trouble with at the time, like, uh, you know, how do I start? When do I finish? Where is this going? What's the point of it? But, um, uh, 
it's directional, but not in a straight line. This is another one of those paintings. Now, some of the objects within this big pile of junk started to be manipulated. And they were manipulated along the lines of, uh, if you imagine that that pile of junk was a world and the objects were evolving in it, the, the, the only um, parameters for what they would become is that they become interesting to paint. So their survival and their adaptation, as it were, uh, became a matter of me you know, not just shoveling things around and it being accidental, but doing odd things like, for example, putting this, I don't know if you can see on the silver child's jacket, there's a skateboard knee pad, which I tipped the contents of a packet of um, instant soup onto and then sprayed that with <laughs> red paint. So they're quite... Um, irrational or, or per, you know, to all intents and purposes, there are crazy things to do, but for the purpose of creating this thing which uh, could lead to me painting the thing, they made sense. So um, the more complicated and the more perverse, the better, actually, it seemed. I also liked what was happening with these things whereby the objects which quite you know more often than not were just things which would were rubbish like this used drinks carton could take up a role within the painting that almost meant that they you know they'd taken up a, a position in there um, far in excess of what they actually were so you, you know, th these things be begin to have a role of identity within this thing. So you can see in this painting, there's a, in the lower right hand corner, there's a, a, a box which somebody had had a new television delivered in. And then that's starting to have things stuck onto it and it turned into that. Sorry for the interruption. That's fine, that's good. <laughs> um, I'm just interested in, because um, you started off by telling about the eye. Yes. Uh, and <clears throat> is it, um, are you interest, mostly interested in how your eye react? Is it like a, a physiolo physiological study of how your eye react to what you see and then you build on it the next day? Or so that y you just want to see what happens when you do that? Or are you interested in, in how you perceive it, the perception part of it? Do you interpret what you see or do you just register? Well, um, I, I'm not... Uh, a scientist who's studying the physiological uh, biology of the eye. I'm I come I'm coming at it from the point of view of of being an artist. So, um, in one way, in this work, it's an attempt to just turn it into a, a case of seeing something. So. Um, the the way the things are painted is very uh, straightforward, shall we say. Although within that, it's incredibly complicated, just the, the, the act of transforming the world into a language in order to represent it. Um, I can't say that I'm in tr uh, that I couldn't claim to be doing a, f a, a study of of the um, of anything other than my relationship to looking at these things and trying to make a painting. This isn't um, what 
what was interesting me was uh, in some ways this it, it it could be said to be scientific, but in other in other ways I don't see how there's any way I could claim that at all. I mean it's it's scientific as in uh, each day I would propose what was going on. And then that day's activity is in, in a sense some sort of experiment to find out. But um, quite often, you know, what's proposed, if you're an artist, you're not clear about in the first place. So you just have to kind of juggle with the feeling of the thing that you're um, inclined to, to deal with at that particular time. And with these, it was possible to not kid myself that I had an overriding kind of lifelong understanding that it could just be done day to day. Um, does that answer your question? In which way doesn't it though? Because we can keep to this question because it's a good one. <laughs> Well, um, uh, I suppose the artist could also do scientific work, but as an artist. Um, and I'm just asking if, if, if you're thinking about it that way, or if you're interpreting what um. you see, if it goes through a, um, a interpretation before you put it on the canvas. I think. I think if you were to be an effective scientist or an effective artist, you have to share similar things, uh, and those would be an interest in the world and a, a, a love of interest in the world. Um, I think, obviously, their activities are carried out in different ways. Uh, I think. Um, I don't know, it, 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 it doesn't make any sense to say what an artist should or shouldn't be doing. They should just, uh, that they, they're carrying a thing that they have to make sense of. And whatever you find yourself doing, then that's what, you know, as long as you can work out a way to follow that line, uh, then that's what you should be doing. I'm not a scientist. <laughs> Uh, scientists do things like take a question that might be very interesting and very specific and then they think about that for maybe 20 years. Uh, my brain's not really doing that. <laughs> it, it, um <clears throat> it, it's, you know, uh, it's thinking about how to make a painting which contains all of your genuine um, connection to the world without adoption of a of a um, without fudging it or covering it up. You know, without uh, just saying, oh, well, that'll do. Um, it's a good question, and I'm sure, I think we'll come back onto that question at some point. But I feel like changing the image, because I think you might be bored of looking at that one. Uh, this is a, an, another early to mid-2000s work, and uh, it's a lot bigger than the other paintings. The other paintings were about three foot by four foot. This was the biggest thing I could make in the studio that I had at the time, so it's about three meters long. And it combines, well, first of all, I'll tell you what, it, it, it's a painting of a piece of parkland that I used to walk through on my way to work every day. And just a, just a kind of co a corner of this municipal park in a suburban 
area of London. Nothing special going on there, kind of overlooked bit of ground that backs on to people's back gardens. And um, I began drawing this place from standing there and then also got it to a point where I could draw it from memory and have a, a, a cartoon of it in my mind that I was carrying, which I could put down on paper, an image of this place. And the more I did it, the more um, interesting it became that every time I tried to draw it from memory, it would look slightly different, but contain all of the things which I kind of ascertained or, uh, or identified with that place as, as being significant. Then I drew that cartoon out in the studio as big as possible, which is what the, the red line around the outside delineates that image. And mapped into that is information from photographs of that place and then also patches which I which are from paintings that I did outside at that place and then cut out and stuck into this painting. So it's a, 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 a composite of looking actually from being there, from memory and from a photograph. So it's like a massive uh, soup of all this different type of um, information. Uh, Any questions? <laughs> this is the same place, but done another, you know, after doing the first one, I did another one. So this time, when it got drawn out, it's kind of this small part of it, this fence post and uh, uh, nettles have um, overtaken it. Interesting things would happen doing these. For example, this changes in scale would happen. So there's a, a house brick down on the lower right hand corner. And then by the time the painting had swirled round in this kind of whirlpool round to this point, this stone, which is about a third the size of the house brick, has suddenly become three times bigger than the house brick. questions. This was the first painting where there's an object included in this composite, which is at the top, roughly in the middle, which was something part of the scene, which not only done from memory and photographs and painting uh, from, I think, you know, they would call it sur le motif or whatever, in, in, uh, rather than plein air. There's a, a piece of the scene that I try to remake in the studio as a model. So there's a, a, a part of the fence, which you can see is this pink lattice at the top there, which made, was included. No questions? <laughs> okay. Oh, I'll go back. Um, you said something about the red line delineating the kind of frame of the image. Mm. But there's also these kind of red kind of um, zips or flecks that run across this image and it looked like the one before. Can you say anything about 
Yeah, those, uh, the, the parts that you see with the red paint, that's what's left of the cartoon image of the scene that was first laid down before the other information was mapped onto it or, or painted onto it. So you can see that coming through in, in areas. Uh, I didn't want to get pedantic about covering everything and it, it's quite a... Um, it's more like the, the, the information that went on top of that drawing kind of grew onto it almost like uh, lichen or something, so it's quite organic. It's not a case of just covering the whole thing. Also, just for the purely visual aspect of it, it's very effective to have this um, this bright colour. <laughs> okay. Bosk, uh, unrelated actually to that, but you talked about <clears throat> the house brick being smaller than this stone that was in reality smaller than the brick. Mm. And you talked about the way that the image kind of moved around and swirled around. Mm. But does that suggest that somehow there's a kind of... Because um, these images look very all over in terms of the way that the information and the kind of complexity of them is built up. But when you're making them, is there quite a linear kind of movement as you're... Again, I guess it goes back to this idea of looking or, or, or seeing. Are you sort of... Are you moving around quite sort of... Um, in, a, in quite a linear or quite a kind of pedantic way almost as you construct no, the image? Uh, it's not at all like that. It's, um, it's the opposite of that. So uh, it wouldn't be like gridding it up and then filling the grids up. Uh, that's... It's the opposite. <laughs> but then it's not sort of doing something there and doing something there. It was like, uh, I guess, crawling over it like a snail or something. What's the time span for a painting like that? To be honest with you, I can't remember. Um, probably a month, maybe. Um, one of the worst things you can do as an artist is allow yourself to get bored. So, you know, if you find yourself saying, well, if I turn up every morning at nine o'clock and I go in there and I, <laughs> I do five hours of that job, it will be done. Uh, it's tempting to think that's what will happen, but it... Um, it's not the most rewarding way of doing it. So uh, I, um, you have to get over how long something takes. I mean, it's not really the point to me. Well, it was like in terms of how quickly paint comes on. Basically, I try and anything I would try and do, I'd try and do it as quickly as it as it can be done. The actual application of the paint is quite quick. It's not. Um, it's it's as quick as it could be done, whilst also feeling like I'd taken into account every single thing that I could see. Which, although this might look crazily congested and revoltingly full of of detail. I actually felt like I'd held back, <laughs> um, and yet it still looks quite psychotic. And continuing the psychotic vein, <laughs> uh, this painting was mid-2000s, and um, I got a bit fed up of using photographs, and I. I thought I'd try and make a, a, a big, heroic, um, well, 
I like the scale of the other paintings. So this is also a big painting and it's a disaster painting and the disaster is that your freeze is broken and uh, you've got to eat everything <laughs> that you've got in your freezer. And what I was doing was I'd bought, I spent uh, like a I did basically, I guess, what would be the average kind of three child households weekly or fortnightly shop in a supermarket. And so it's lots of very basic food. And I had a deep freeze in my studio and uh, I just thought, well, I'm going to, you know, just try and paint food because it, it seemed to be something that I'd always loved in paintings of still life. Uh, but here what's happened is that the food started to change and every time I got it in and out of the freezer it would stick together. So I started to use that and stick things together uh, in the way I'd been sticking objects together. Uh, so on top of this odd table, which is at one moment in a very um, identifiable fixed position and at other moments shifting in a few different dimensional positions, there is uh, what became the, 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 the fate of most of this food, which is it formed into this massive block in the center. I don't know if you can see that rectangular kind of slab. And it's become like a figure frozen in, uh, in this food. So. I don't know. If, I don't have a pointer, so I can't point it out to you. But if you imagine that slab lying on the table, at the top end there are two oranges with donuts on, and those have become the eyes. And then moving down from that slightly, there are two pies with chocolate fingers sticking out, and those are the two hands where it's kind of laying on its back, frozen. Uh, a bit like Han Solo frozen in carbonite. And there are other objects which, um, where the, the food started to grow into these strange things. Um, what about the candle? Yeah, the candle um, obviously got painted a few times. Um, so, and it's become a nice, effective kind of visualization of time. A bit corny, but <laughs> I didn't actually set out for that to happen. But it, and it. In one of these, I'd painted this one summer, it was a very hot summer, and my studio was very hot, so the candles actually just melted and flopped over like that. Like a flaccid kind of penis shape thing. So, uh, what you've got here is a lot of material, um, substance, matter, which is forming and reforming and changing and um, I really didn't know what the hell I was doing by the end of this. It just seems totally... Uh, there are some things I really... Um, find interesting about it, but I can see a lot of things that I would have done very different. And maybe one day I'll go back to... The, to, to um, deal with this again. <laughs> Any questions?
Okay, this next painting it was done in the zoo, and uh, I included it after that previous painting because it struck me that uh, this building that I became obsessed with in the zoo had a similar feeling of um, an odd tectonic kind of confection of material uh, which was fixed but had a its relationship to time and its purpose seemed um, mysterious. <coughs> This is the same building, but seen from a different angle. If it can be called a building, it was basically a fake network of caves that uh, one of these animals was meant to inhabit, which I think you know, at some point they're deemed as being unsuitable or unsafe because they, you know, the animal wasn't there anymore. Uh, and. I really like this balanced rock that was overhanging. So I tried to remake that in my studio and I made some, uh, some kind of sedimentary uh, rock, but it was made out of all the junk that was around and bits of coal and mud and expanding foam and cardboard and I try to remake this overhanging thing uh, which didn't overhang for very long and just collapsed down in a big pile. Yeah. What happens to these models or objects after you're done painting them? Uh, they I run out of space in the studio and they get superseded by the next project. So they 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 just get um discarded. But do you ever kind of recycle them and use yes. them again? For, well, uh, this, um, these objects include a lot of the things that had been lying around from those first paintings that I showed you, but they were all uh, compressed into molds that I'd made with all this other stuff to make a kind of um, like a sedimentary sort of thing. I don't know. It's a, uh, <coughs> another thing that I made out of the um, I can't really call them another thing that I made is that which is the first of these paintings which uh, uses what originally I think was a, a child's sandpit, which is this orange plastic vacuum formed frame shape, but that's now been stuck onto the wall and it's had some dials glued onto it and it's been turned into a, a portal in which other objects can appear. I mean, obviously, it's not. It's just this thing stuck on the wall with some oranges glued in it and, and hung in there. But uh, it's, you know, some sort of function reassignment for these objects. And um, In some way, at the time, it seemed like the most sensible thing to do with these things. Uh, to reveal something of themselves.
Any questions? <laughs> I'm also very curious about these objects and your relationship with them. Um, because one of the reasons I'm here tonight is that I don't really understand the painting as a medium. Well, I, I'm i here, so I'm interested. <laughs> but um, I'm like, I got, and I'm just very curious, and I would actually like to see these objects as objects. Sorry? Um, I just, I'm, I'm just getting very curious about seeing these objects, like in real life. So what I would like to ask you is why you're painting them and not showing them, or what's, like, yeah, what's the relationship well, between the painting um, and the object and uh, you? I think the the second question is easier for me to get to grips with. Uh, the relationship of these things to me painting them. I think comes from um, an aspect that had become apparent to me whereby I could paint something that I'd done something to, that there'd been some sort of action involved in, in where my hand had been involved in that thing. And then that gave me something to latch on to or some connection to that thing and it made painting it possible. Uh, so um, it was almost like because I had made that thing then touching it and touching it with my eyes seemed to be a, a much easier uh, It seemed to work. That, see, it, it, it. So there's that. Uh, why don't why don't I show these objects? Well, this was made in 2006, and I'd had this thing around in my studio for a long time, and it had gone up on the wall, maybe two or three years earlier and had all sorts of things gone in there. And there's another painting of it, which is in this show. Uh, if I'd then put, you know, if I'd said, well, I'm gonna put that in a gallery, it wouldn't have been in my studio anymore in order to do all those other things it had to do. So it kind of became um, a site of and a means to a certain way of thinking, which was allowing me to make the paintings. Uh, it didn't really occur to me at the time that I should exhibit these things. And maybe that was a mistake, but I don't really, that's not what happened. That's not what I was doing. <laughs> um, uh, I wasn't interested in saying, look, um, here's this orange crate with a load of oranges stuck in it and some knobs on. That's not, you know, that's not what it's about. Uh, it may well have looked great or interesting or, or had a kind of frisson to it, it to put something like that in the gallery. and. Um, for me, it's a portal, but the portal is for me to access the oranginess of orange and the oranginess of the oranges and what they're like. 
you know, together in that situation. Um, It's interesting to me that you say that you now want to see those things. Yeah, and like it's like the painting is like, well, okay, I'm not interested in that. <laughs> I want to see that thing. Yeah. <laughs> I think yeah, um, it's, it's about, um, to me, but that's because I don't, I don't really understand it, I think. But to me, the, the painting becomes more of a representation of something. And especially when you actually make these objects, and they mm. are physical, and they are somehow real, but then you paint them, and then... Well, uh, um, does it what I like about you? painting is that it is also a real thing. Mm. And to me, it's not just an image. I mean, you're looking at an image there. Mm. Uh, learning how to paint is learning how to make uh, how to make your thoughts real through that thing. Um, uh, the world is full of interesting, extraordinary objects and um, I think I've lost track of what you were actually asking. <laughs> uh, but does it, it so I can see how it, it, you know, it sort of doesn't make sense because in a way they do look so much like an object, an art object that you would put in a gallery or that could have that, um, that it could result in that thing. So, um, Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, maybe one day I will exhibit some sculptures, but they, the things I have around my studio are so uh, involved with their own life in that place. You know, they're changing all that. The, there's no, I would feel weird about saying, okay, well that stops now and it's gonna go on a plinth or go there or they're, they're, they're uh, it's more a process thing. Does that make sense? <laughs> I can't claim to totally understand it either, and I don't think um, that's really your job. Uh, being confused is quite a good um, a good standpoint. As long as you've got something to grab onto that makes sense, the whole thing doesn't necessarily have to. Uh, here are some other objects. These are um, these are lumps of concrete, which, which uh, originally, I guess, had been put down as the foundations for a building, a barn, or some kind of thing. So they have these RSJ steel bars, which have been set in them. And they've been pulled out from the holes that the concrete was poured in, like teeth or something, and they've been dumped. When I saw them, uh, I thought they looked, that there was something really uh, connected to my mind about them. They looked like a family of things. Uh, and they, they struck me as being a bit like a, a kind of stone circle. They weren't, although they weren't laid out in a circle, they'd been put there like a group or a family that were waiting or looking at something. So um, I made a couple of paintings of them. Uh, so they're kind of lying there watching and waiting and this is the first painting 
may seem a bit nervous. And this is the next painting that I made of them, where they changed a bit. Uh, they look a bit more optimistic and ready to kind of give up something. As I painted these more, uh, interesting things started to happen in terms of how different the paintings were and how different the objects looked in them. So uh, it seemed like the reality of the things themselves was quite flexible. So by this painting, one of them had decided to uh, take over. <laughs> and it, um, this painting is in the show in the gallery there. Uh, so the, the, the concrete lump on the far right has kind of expanded. A bit like um, the in the painting earlier where the stone that was one scale in reality has become another in the painting. So if this is a story of these stones, uh, if this was a story of them, you know, the one stone would have like a chapter that was much, much longer than, <laughs> than any part of the book devoted to the others. This is another one where they've changed again. When I was painting these, I was uh, enjoying the moss on them. And then when I came here and took a walk up the mountain there, I suddenly realized that you've got this stuff everywhere here. <laughs> this is another one. Um, Uh, the, uh, the next three paintings are all of the same piece of concrete, but in each painting uh, they manifest themselves in a different way thanks to the interesting nature of what was happening. So that's one. That's the other one, which is in the show here. And... That's the last one, which it's all the same thing, but obviously it looks totally different in each image, each painting. Any questions? Uh, it looks like the colors that you use are very intense. So I was, I was wondering how you deal with colors. Uh, do you try to make them resemble what they look like when you see them, or are they kind of saturated? Um, well, if I was to say that this is what the world looked like to me, you'd think, well, he's a bit mad, but um, I spent ages in the very frustrating activity of trying to look at something and then mix colors up to, to, to match it. Ignoring the fact that the world's not like that, y 
you you can't look at something and then look away and look back and it be the same. It's not. Everything's uh, changing. The light's changing. That's one of the hardest things when you're actually painting from something is to elevate your thought process out of the kind of moment to moment variability of the world and to try and hold something that you can turn into a type of language that you can uh, convert the world into and retain um, the thing that you're trying to get at. Uh, so the colors are paint yeah. and the paint um, if you're going to make a painting then you just I just thought it's got to be as alive as possible so the paint's got to live in you know it's got to have a life in your hands rather than you trying to um, restrict it so they're quite um, the color thing's quite open it's uh, It's a version of the world. Does that make sense? Kind of. <laughs> okay. I mean, I guess it's something that's difficult to answer because I guess what I'm asking you is how do you decide which color something should have? But maybe that's intuitive. It is quite intuitive. Uh, and if I think about the actual decisions that it seems like I'm making, then in the light of certain facts, those are, it, it, is, it is a ridiculous sort of... You, know, you, you look at something and you say, well, that's that color and it's a bit like that. So you just start working with it. And... Um, then everything you put down on the painting has to make sense to, in to, to the relationship of the things you're looking at. But it's a conversion of a relationship. It's not, it's not the actual. It's not like a. Um, it's not trying to pin down the world. It's trying to give life to your to the thing you're making. <coughs> this. <coughs> this is another object that um, this object was a pyramid made out of cardboard which has then been tipped over and the inside of it is painted out in a kind of dark blue paint so what you're looking you're looking up inside a pyramid That was the first kind of makeshift the cardboard thing that I started constructing, which led on to this type of painting, which still uses that orange crate that's on the wall, but it's been adapted now and it's kind of it's had an early modern makeover with this other cardboard thing put around it. And inside there, there is cardboard, which uh, was the result of me cutting out shapes from sheets of cardboard to try and make things which I'd been looking at in images taken through a, an electron microscope. So I'd, I think I'd, in that one I'd been trying to make some sugar crystal shapes. But the piece of cardboard that was left after cutting those shapes out I found very interesting. So I took that and it got folded up and it's been sprayed gold and it's got some lumps of expanding foam on it because I've been trying to glue other things on there. Then that's stuck into that portal thing and become the subject of a painting. That's another one. Um, 
I quite liked the idea that it felt linked to the other things I'd been doing from objects in the studio and um, I liked it that it had an origination in some world you couldn't see but that was very uh, significant. Any questions? No? At the same time, these, this is 2012, and this is also 2012. This is a painting, uh, one of the paintings that I was doing outside from just being around on the streets around where my studio is. Uh, it's a building. This building has been knocked down now. Uh, I found it really rewarding and very, uh, it felt great to just be outside um, trying to paint these things that you know, they might be, I might end up just painting something that I can see from quite a way away. But just, you know, that the whole place where I was just seemed full of uh, an inexhaustible uh, world that could be painted. Any questions? I think with these paintings, what um, what's what felt or became apparently the most significant result of this activity was uh, how the relationship to um, my looking at that thing and painting it seemed to make apparent what I guess is the actual subject which is some relationship to between time and space and my place in it and consequently you know humans place in it not uh, somebody must have a question at some point <laughs> Uh, these uh, later ones you've shown us and the con concrete ones, are they painted on site or from photographs? Uh, they're painted from in front of the thing on site. Uh, I gave up painting from photographs. I just found it really annoying. The texture the quality of the decision making is totally different. What I found myself doing with photographs was just like going further and further and further into them and becoming absorbed in the actual thing. You know, not the thing it was an image of, but the, the thing that I was holding in my hand, which was just a piece of paper with some stuff on it. <laughs> Um,
Um, do you tilt the canvas when you paint them? Well, I have the paintings on a tricycle thing, which I've put together, which is, um, I think, I've not seen one around town here. They're, they're called Christiana bikes. Uh, uh, and usually in London you see environmentally conscious parents taking their kids to school in them. But mine's got a big easel in the front. And uh, so at times the easel isn't totally horizontal so depending on the pavement or the angle yeah but I don't purposely go okay now I'm gonna make it go like that um, I I don't get a ruler out and stop and do that uh, where they are at, at odd angles. Um, that just all adds to the thing as far as I'm concerned. It's not... Um, I think if I was to start purposefully making that happen, though, it would become a bit ridiculous. I think um, I'm trying not to imagine that, you know, this is just a result of the painting, the canvas being at a slightly odd angle. But I like to think, looking at these after I've made them, that, you know, what they've managed to contain about me standing there looking at that place and, and painting it is not just uh, that shop, but um, the widest possible perspective that I'm standing there looking at this thing on a planet that's moving around and time is passing. Um, so there's a, a an element of uh, um, the broadest possible physical kind of, uh, physical nature of what's happening. Um, any questions? How do you decide where to stop on your bike? Um, well, with this painting, I thought that shop looks interesting. With this painting, I thought, oh, look, there's some red. <laughs> uh, with this painting, I just thought, I'm just going to stop anywhere. And the first thing that grabs my eye, I'll paint. So in the studio, I'd just been painting a hexagonal shape and I noticed the hexagonal shape or this you know this kind of burglar alarm thing so that became the middle of the picture it's pretty random and that's one of the things I really like about it, uh, it the implication is that it doesn't matter what path you take uh, that's um, the world is inexhaustible. And anything could be a subject for this activity. Uh, it's the activity that's the interesting thing. It's, you know, the things I stop to paint are 
there's just something about them that might snag on my eye and mind that I think, uh, you know, okay, I can grab, I can, that's a starting point. Um. I have a comment to, um, to these pictures. I'm a photographer. Okay. Let me say this. <laughs> And uh, um, I could have discovered these things. And it's strange for me, or it's, I'm waiting for the word discovery. Mm. Because that's how I, as a photographer, think. It's, it's a way of discovering. Uh, if there's something, and, and these are great discoveries. This is how I feel about it. And, and um, and what you do after discovering it, because it's not random, it's what you see and what you isolate mm -hmm. and what you, what you um, figure out that this is, this is it, in a right. way. That can't be random, that's the way your brain tells you to mm -hmm. look. Uh, maybe photographers think about this differently than painters, but I'm, I'm not sure about that. Well, I, I would agree with you. Uh, it's not random, it's, uh, there's a kind of order, mm -hmm. but it's linked more to the kind of orders that, you know, if I, um, the kind of orders that you read about that come out of chaotic systems, mm. so. Uh, yeah. But my only point I would make is um, these, that place doesn't look like this. No, no. Uh, that doesn't so matter to me. I, I don't care. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, There's still great discoveries. Yeah? Well, uh, yeah, there's, disco like we there's, have there's uh, discoveries to be made every... The, the world is inexhaustible. This idea that, you know, that there's a, a, a narrative that is leading to some end. Is, yes. um, is counterproductive. There is, there is a Norwegian folk tale uh, that has to do with this, um, about a, a lad going around finding strange things and saying, look what I found, look what I found, whether well, this is, throw it away, this isn't worth anything, the others say, no, but look what I found, I'm sure I can use it for some time. Yeah, so, so this is what I tie up with with the discovering, the way of seeing the value and isolating in the chaos something that might be of value. And, and if I was a painter, I would probably paint it. Now I'm a photographer, um, so I photograph it. I can't really see the... Is there a difference? Uh, because in, in discovery, yes no. <laughs> in discovery, it's it's the need to show, right? Um, I uh, in I basically agree with everything you're saying, but what I found in doing these is uh, that. So, for example, in this painting, um, the part that first made me stop and think, okay, I'm going to start work here, uh, was the, the, the upper, the, the, the blue sign on the top and this kind of silver flashing that had become slightly dislodged and then been repaired a few times, so it's become a bit lumpy and weird. But uh, what became the discovery in the painting, and there are so many of them, for example, I, found, I thought uh, what happened with this green rectangle that was coming in on the right hand side I had no it you know that that was just such a fantastic kind of 
thing to happen. Um, if I was a photographer, I would have possibly stopped and thought, oh, look at those two screens, you know, in that kind of odd relationship in that shop window there. But that's not why I stopped, but that's the thing that ended up uh, happening in the painting. And I think that's the thing that the painting revolves around, is these two screens that are kind of huddling or consoling each other and peering out of this window. Now, the way you see them in the painting is not even the way they actually look in reality. So that discovery is as much internal as it is uh, about that shop window. So the way that I ended up, the way those things manifested themselves, um, that's a discovery. But it's not, that's, um, it's kind of inside the thing. It's not, uh, maybe I'm just being difficult because uh, I do agree with you. <laughs> but, but what I'm trying to say is that there's something else going on with a painting which is a bit, uh, um, which makes me think that doing the painting is more an excuse for finding something which is not in the world, but which you're carrying around yourself, maybe. Um, I'm just trying to imagine that there is a diff. Well, yeah, the m there is a difference, but um, uh, I do like photography. Don't get me wrong, I, I just... Um, I'm not very good at it. <laughs> that's the last image, so that's the end of the talk. Yes, yeah, please, uh, please. Uh, thank you. Um, I have more a question to Martin, and it's um, about talking about the knowing of it and talking about the showing of it, and that there, like, and where maybe it overlaps and where it's a big difference to invite a philosopher. Was it was his name Graham Harmon? Yeah, Graham Harmon to to talk about the exhibition and the difference about asking an artist to talk about the exhibition. I didn't expect to get a question at the end. Um, if I understood, there are two parts to your question. In terms of the idea of the kind of knowing of it and the showing of it, I think it's quite interesting because when I first began working on the exhibition, there was a group show that I was thinking about. And then I was also simultaneously writing a text on Simon's work for, for, for the show at Tate Britain that happened a couple of years ago. And what happened was that while I was thinking about this group show and while I was looking at Simon's work and writing this piece of text, many of the same ideas were, were kind of mixing together and they were kind of informing each other. Which is not unusual, I don't think, that's how people work. But then I began to think that we could, I, I could either explore some of these ideas that I was interested in, which was to do with the kind of nature and materiality of the world and objects, and also this kind of split or this kind of gap between the reality of a thing, if you can call it that, and its image and the way that it appears to us or reveals itself to us. 
I thought, well, I could either do that just through a solo show of Simon's work, or I could do that through this group show I've been thinking about. And it was at that point that I then thought, well, maybe it's interesting to have this two-part exhibition and to think about both of those things happening. And then when I was talking to the co-curator of the group show, Stephen Claydon, it became clear that he had read a book called Ridley Walker by Russell Hoban, which I had also read a few years before, and which very strangely, when Simon had come to visit the very first time in Bergen, I just kind of plucked off my bookshelf, and I hadn't even thought about it, but I just said to Simon, I don't know whether you've read this book, but it's really great, you should take it and read it. And then Simon had been reading this book as well. So there was this kind of moment where we suddenly started thinking about this text. So the text actually came quite late, but the reason I mention that is that the title, the knowing of it and the showing of it comes from this book, Ridley Walker. And many of you who've attended some of these um, talks over the last few weeks and months will have heard me talk about this already. But in a way, the fact that the first show was called The Knowing of It and Simon's show is called The Showing of It, I think it's important to say is, is kind of arbitrary. There was a line in that book where, um, and I can't go into too much detail because we've all been sat here a long time already, but there's a line in the book where um, this character says, I ain't the knowing of it, I'm only just the showing of it. And that sentence felt really kind of important, and that idea felt really kind of important, that something could be something and could reveal itself in a way without necessarily knowing what it was. And maybe even listening to the way that Simon was talking about kind of artistic practice and the fact that often artists are making things, they're making images or they're making objects, but not entirely necessarily consciously in a, in a kind of intellectual sense about exactly what that is or why but that something can reveal itself even without knowing what it is. So that was the kind of idea I was interested in. And then, I ain't the knowing of it, I'm only just the showing of it, was a bit of a mouthful. And because we had this two-part structure, I thought we could call the first part the knowing of it, and the second part the showing of it, to just begin to open up this idea that there was this gap between these two different, um, these two different uh, realities or, or kind of ideas of, 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 of kind of being or existence. That was the first bit. I've forgotten what the second part of your question was now. I st spent such a long time answering it. Um, oh yeah, about, about asking a philosopher and then asking an artist. Um, we asked Graham Harmon because he'd been writing a lot about um, this kind of object-oriented ontology, speculative realism. He's been very central to the development of that philosophical system and thinking. And this, neither of these shows are about that. And certainly Simon isn't somebody, when I started talking to Simon, he wasn't necessarily aware of Graham's writing, and, and, and nor was I until very recently. So it's not that um, that kind of thinking and object-oriented ontology has underpinned these exhibitions and the development of them. But I do think in Harmon's writing in particular, there's a particular kind of aesthetic sensibility which I find really interesting. And I think the way that he sometimes tries to write about some of these ideas that he's dealing with, these ideas of a kind of object-object of object relations, like outside of human subjectivity, often um, approaches the kind of condition of the way that artists work. And, and I think there's, there's often what he's criticized for, there's a lot of kind of gaps or, or conjecture in his philosophy. But I think that's exactly the point, and I think that it sits closer to the idea of an artistic practice in that you can propose things without necessarily having uh, kind of systematized them or rationalized them in a certain way. But yet they can still have a kind of poetic resonance somehow. So that's why we invited Graham. Um, in terms of thinking about the way that he would talk in relation to an artist, I think the art world is a real, one of the most interesting things about the art world as a space is that you can bring so many different kind of disciplines and kind of uh, positions into that. And so, um, actually, Graham's talked in quite a lot of arts, arts and architecture institutions. But yeah, I think it was interesting to, I, in some senses, I just wanted, I wanted him to look at the show. So it was an excuse to bring him over and to see what he'd say after he'd looked at the show, because I thought it might be interesting. Yeah, 
Yeah, then uh, I think you shall just ask, yeah, thank uh, Simon for the talk and for answering all the questions. And thank you all as well for coming and for asking these questions. Thank you, Simon. Thank you.